You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Good afternoon, and thank you for tuning in to WCAT Radio's Vows, Vocations, and Promises, Discerning the Call of Love. I am your host, Dr. Marianne Erlachis. As a part of our ongoing series, spotlighting the authors who have contributed chapters to the comprehensive new book entitled Spiritual Husbands, Spiritual Fathers, Priestly Formation for the 21st Century, edited by Bishop Philippe Estevez and Bishop Andrew Cousins and published by Holy Apostles College and Seminaries and Route Books and Media, I have the privilege of speaking with an individual who has contributed three chapters to this book, Deacon James Keating. Before fully launching into today's program and detailing my guest's extensive background and expertise, I would like to invite Deacon Keating to begin with a prayer. Sure, thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace in providing the church for priests, priests whom we need desperately to minister at the altar of salvation and uh, continue your active ministerial presence of offering salvation to the whole world. We pray for these priests, and we pray that their numbers increase. We ask this through the Blessed Virgin Mary and all of our patron saints, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Deacon Keating. Deacon James Keating has an extensive background and expertise in seminary formation. Deacon James is a nationally recognized seminary theologian, spiritual director, and formator, was recently accepted an appointment by Archbishop Robert J. Carlson to the formation staff and as a professor of spiritual theology at Kenrick Glennon Seminary in St. Louis. He has also served as the Director of Theological Formation for the Institute for Priestly Formation at Creighton University in Omaha, and prior to that appointment with the Institute for Priestly Formation, he was a Professor of Moral and Spiritual Theology at the Pontifical College of the Josephinium in Columbus, Ohio. Additionally, Deacon Keating has served as the Director of Deacon Formation for the Archdiocese of Omaha. Deacon Keating received his doctorate in moral and spiritual theology from DeQuesne University. He is a widely published and respected peer-reviewed journals, has authored numerous books and book chapters, including three chapters in Spiritual Husbands and Spiritual Fathers, uh, Real Celibacy as an Invitation from Divine Beauty, Chapter 1, Imagination Prayer in the Spousal Gift, Chapter 5, The Seminary is Nazareth, Chapter 21, Deacon Keating has given over 800 presentations in the last 30 years, including more than 40 retreats for bishops, vocation directors, diocesan priests, deacons, and married couples since 2017 alone. Welcome, Deacon Keating. Thank you for working time into your enormously busy schedule to come and, and talk with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure being with you. This is a phenomenal text aimed at providing a spiritual and psychological resource that engenders effective maturity and fruitful chaste celibacy for the renewal of priestly formation, a goal which was expressed by the Church in the 2016 Ratio Fundamentalis and the sixth edition of the Program for Priestly Formation. Your contribution to this book is enormous. Um, I love that you bookend it. You've got Chapter 1 and you've got Chapter 21. In Chapter 1, you mention beautifully that real celibacy is an invitation from divine beauty. Can you, can you extrapolate? Can you tell me a bit about how this is an invitation from divine beauty? Sure. It's, um, sometimes people try to reduce celibacy to a pragmatism, as if uh, priests are very busy and therefore they don't have time for wives. Um, as I say in the first chapter, uh, there are a lot of busy people in the world. I mean, uh, firemen are busy, surgeons are busy. If we're just basing our celibacy on pragmatism to allow a man to be more available to work, well, that's hardly, uh, I think, a standard for uh, someone presiding at the, the sacramental uh, font of our church. The standard for celibacy is a man has been so captivated by the beauty of God that this beauty communicates to him the possibility 
of that beauty sustaining even his bodily needs uh, in the way that a man would fall in love with the beauty of a woman. And then he and that woman would marry, produce children, and deepen their intimacy through emotional sharing and physical sharing of their bodies. For the celibate, he has glimpsed into the origin of that love. He has glimpsed into the very origin of married love, and that is Trinitarian love. And he has seen that the marriage uh, that we enter into is is a symbol of the origin. And he is noticing in his own heart that the origin itself is calling him. And so he is beguiled by this beauty, and he wishes to be sustained by this beauty in a way analogous to the way uh, a husband would be sustained by the emotional intimacy and physical intimacy of his wife, which is uh, something that the male needs. He needs to give himself completely so that he can receive completely from the object of his love. And so for the man called to celibacy, uh, his future then depends upon, and as he grows more mature in his vocation, it also becomes his delight that his future depends upon deepening contemplative prayer, deepening intimacy with the Trinity itself. This is such a beautiful chapter. You mentioned in there that if a man receives a true call to sacrificial, uh, to sacrifice marriage and fatherhood in light of the overwhelming beauty of God's own love and to enter the priesthood, then this gift of God will deepen within the formative relationships that constitute um, a seminarian's mission. So this gift of beauty, this gift of giving oneself in totality, which is another theme that you stress uh, throughout that chapter, um, is, a, is a gift that, that exists in such a way that it pervades all of the other relationships that that seminarian and future priest will have. Yes, that's why it's proper to speak of it as spousal, because just sure. as the uh, bachelor's mind uh, becomes filled with the woman that he loves. And the bachelor's mind is, is converted to a spousal mind where uh, the woman becomes his first interest. So with the seminarian, the future priest, uh, God becomes his first interest. And the first interest of God is his church. So he entrusts the church to the celibate priest who is uh, fascinated as his first interest with God himself and then the needs of the people whom God loves. And this beauty um, sustains him in his whole, uh, his whole approach to life. So he becomes freer and freer as his contemplative prayer deepens and deepens because he is anticipating the end, the very point and object of human life, and that is to be in the deepest of communion with God himself. A lot of times this frightens people when you describe celibate celibacy this way because they prefer it for it to be pragmatic. Uh, sure. that, you know, it's just there for the bishop to move people around more easily. But what that uh, really is hiding is a fear of intimacy. And they, uh, the man who would rather describe celibacy pragmati- pragmatically uh, usually has some uh, fear of intimacy with such a radical love as God approaching so closely and inviting a gift of the man's body, a gift of the man's body to God himself. And, and that can be overwhelming. And so there are some people who just maybe just don't like marriage, don't want to be bothered with it, see the priesthood as some type of career choice or whatever. And, and they're not really uh, vulnerable to the deeper meaning and the deeper uh, sustained truth of what God is doing when he comes that close to a man and says, May I live my mysteries over again in your body. Wow, that is really such a a robust and beautiful concept, and not one that is often articulated well to the laity. Um, 
that this is this is the, the spousal love to which your priest is called. This is how you can best support him in this Trinitarian relationship and how you can best pray for him. Um, I, I love your section there on his first interest and that the seminarian's first interest, just like any other man who is in love, becomes the bride, the beloved. Um, and it is an interest in with that which is holy and with God himself. Um, another point that you mentioned in this first section is that the genius of the seminary system is to form integrated men, and that integrated men possess a holy, effective maturity. Can you go into detail there? Right. I think it's one of the few uh, educational institutions left in the Western world that actually takes seriously the development of the student, if you want to call him that, as a human being. Uh, We mouth that maybe through other uh, educational systems, but in the end, most educational systems are either just purely academic or ideological, pushing some uh, political agenda these days. But in the seminary, uh, a man is captured by God who is uh, relentless in maturing the man until he is self-donative. So he may come in uh, filled with some level of self-interest, some level of egocentricity, and if he really engages in the formation program, which is approaching both his growth in charity, his growth in a love of truth, his growth in the love of God, and his understanding of what it means to be a mature male. If he really engages this program, then uh, God will have his way with him. And on the other end of the program, the other end of the formation, will be a man laying on the cathedral floor who has truly died to himself and then rises to ask the question of Christ's bride. Where is your pain? How may I serve that pain? How may Christ serve that pain to the ministrations of the sacramental life? And so, um, to some extent, I think seminaries today are actually preserving the most integral education uh, system left on the planet. And I think it will not only gift the world with uh, priest, but eventually, in this kind of uh, crazy, mindless world we're living in, it will be the last memory of what a real education is. And sure. uh, the, the Catholic seminaries in the future perhaps will be looked to as the places of, of preservation of sanity. As the monastic system of the, the Middle Ages saved Western civilization, perhaps it will be the seminary system that revitalizes and saves authentic education. I think the, I think the seeds are there for that. Um, even as you know, we, we went through the, the sexual uh, clerical crisis, it was one of the impetuses to be more bold and more vigorous in really forming the whole man and not sure. just passing on data like is done at schools where data is passed on and that's called education. So a negative has really turned into a positive for a fuller engagement of uh, the way of formation rather than simply the way of passing on information. Information that is regurgitated and forgotten later on as well. Right, just a head trip, yeah. Right, right. Um, very good, very good, interesting point there. Thank you. Um, I love this chapter. I love in each of your chapters the resources, the prayer at the end. Um, this, it's just, just such a beautiful, uh, complete um, work there. As we move on to Chapter 5, Imagination, Prayer, and the Spousal Gift, uh, you have a lovely section on St. Joseph as the husband of Mary and the brother to priests. And you note that St. Joseph assists the priest to receive his spousal identity because Joseph himself knew the surprise of being called to the same paradoxical vocation, the virgin spouse, referencing Matthew one twenty. Could you speak to that? Right. Sometimes I think um, some of the men think that maybe they're unique in, in church history, that uh, you know, this has befallen them, this fascination with divine beauty. 
But uh, Joseph was both fascinated with divine beauty and feminine beauty. And, and they were uh, radiated in one person. So when he was falling in love with Mary, shall we say, he was also gazing at the Immaculate Conception. He was gazing wow. at the purity of God himself, who, who had attached himself, so to speak, to Mary's heart. And so uh, we could say this about Joseph. He had no chance. I mean, he, if you didn't fall in love with Mary, something was wrong with you. Sure. And because there was beauty itself. Uh, radiating from God and the intimacy that Mary had with God due to the Immaculate Conception. But Joseph was a man. He was not the male counterpart to the Immaculate Conception. He wanted a wife. He wanted a good wife. He wanted a holy wife. He wanted to be holy. And to some extent, um, of course, he was a saint, but to some extent, he's a man. And these men in the seminary are called in the same way and maybe is equally surprised that they have been uh, the ones to see this beauty in the way that Joseph did, and that they have responded to this beauty. And so he becomes one of their most important intercessors in the way of chaste celibacy. As a married man living in Mary's house, they were both dedicated to God above all, living in a chaste relationship. And so here is the the best male intercessor for the seminarian uh, to go to regularly and and to uh, ask him to intercede for the grace that's needed to reverence the beauty that the seminarian has been called into and to uh, receive the deepest of joy from such a call in the same way that Joseph received the deepest of joy in being married to the Immaculate Conception. In, in Joseph, we see, as spouse of Mary and this beautiful spousal, chaste spousal love, the, the fulfillment of masculinity, too. As he gazes at her beauty, he is called to authentic masculinity. And all of the, all of the titles that we have in the church for him, terror of demons, protector of the holy family, um, all of those are in some way rooted in that authentic masculinity, too. Yes, and authentic masculinity is very important to, to talk about because it is um, the end of uh, Western masculinity as we define it today. And Western masculinity today is a, um, a soup of self-involvement, a, a way of living that uh, simply responds to immediate gratification. Mm. And here we have Joseph, who is the embodiment of patience, the embodiment of trust, the embodiment of waiting on the Lord. And what we have today in the Western world are males who are uh, confused, who sure. actually think that uh, masculinity is basically the life of the weekend. Uh, the life of Friday night, the light of Saturday night, the immaturity that lingers from high school continues now well into people's 30s and 40s. And so um, a lot of the men who have been called by Christ to follow him in the priesthood have been infected by the Western culture's superficiality and idolatry of immediate gratification. And so Joseph becomes the model for self-donation not self-gratification, self-gift, patience with God, patience in understanding mystery. He doesn't have to know it all. He has to just entrust himself both to the Blessed Mother and to the origin of the Blessed Mother's beauty, the Trinity itself. So in throwing themselves into a intercessory relationship with Joseph, the men are also opening themselves to uh, admire and emulate Joseph's own uh, masculinity. And just like Our Lady's help and the re relationship we have with her is real and her intercession is real, this is a real friendship as, as the, the man seeks to emulate St. Joseph and asks for his intercession. It is a real intercession. Um, and there, it's two-way communication. Um, you also mentioned in this chapter the role of St. John the Evangelist. Could you speak to that? 
Yeah, what, what, uh, what way um, do you want me to go in that what direction with the time we have left? Um, just let me know how St. John the Evangelist plays into this, this um, relationship, budding relationship that the seminarian finds himself in as he seeks to deepen his relationship with the Trinity and make it a spousal relationship. Well, St. John, you know, is given to the Blessed Mother, and uh, St. John was also the one, you know, we, we say always leaning on the heart of Christ at the Last Supper. So John was privileged with great intimacy, both, both with God himself incarnate and then the Mother of God. And so uh, John becomes this uh, friend of the seminarian regarding the deepest intimacy with Mary, who represents the church. Under the cross, Mary is the church. And uh, Jesus is giving John, the priest, the bishop, giving uh, John to the church. And so in their uh, growing friendship, again, as intercessor, St. John uh, leads the seminarian in chaste celibacy to the deepest service of the bride of Christ, Paradoxically, because of her celibacy and her orientation to God and God alone, Mary is seen as both uh, the bride of, of Christ and the church itself, as well as the mother of Christ. But because she was perfectly oriented, this is why she gets these two uh, metaphorical labels about her vocation. And John is involved deeply in caring for that church. And this opens up the whole point of a radical, um, total, uh, let's say, gift of paying attention singularly to the needs of the church, even as you're being deeply loved by Christ from the cross. This is one of the great mystical gifts of John. As he's being loved from the cross, he is totally focused on the bride and her needs. Wow. In chapter 21, toward the end of the book, you speak of the seminary as Nazareth, of developing an inner source um, through which the work of priestly formation takes care to guard and make use of the ever deeper communion with the pastoral charity of Christ. Um, Could you speak to this section? There was a time at one point where Pope Paul VI uh, longed to go to Nazareth. He he had like an imaginative prayer where he wanted to be in Nazareth in school, learning uh, at the feet of the Holy Family. And so to some extent, this becomes a a metaphor again for the seminary, Nazareth itself, the hidden years, the 30 or so years where Jesus was simply loved by Joseph and Mary, loved by his Father in heaven. Where, they were, where he was receiving love at such a deep level that it sustained him to the cross. I mean, when you think about his ministry, only a few years, uh, but he had 30 hidden years of the reciprocity of love between his, his mother, his father on earth, Joseph, his father in heaven. So, the, so with the seminarian, he has many years in Nazareth where he is to receive fully in his body the love of the church, the love of the Trinity, the love of his patron saints, the love of the formation staff who who loves both him and the church that they are sending the man out to. And so in this reciprocity of love, in hiddenness, the man is enabled to slough off any of his selfish bachelor ways and begin to know the way of the cross, the way that... um, gives love in spite of suffering, gives love in the face of suffering or evil. And so the church, which is, which is to produce a man as a result of grace and human formation into penetrating, who moves from self-involvement to giving himself as gift to those who are in need. That's what we learn in Nazareth. That's what Jesus learned in Nazareth. That's what... Uh, that he, those hidden years made him capable to go as bridegroom all the way to the cross for the welfare of his bride. In the conclusion of that chapter, you mentioned again that that love of God, Mary and St. Joseph, is real, and that their love affects the seminarian 
even now, all the way through, and that the saints are truly living. Um, I love that thought. Deacon Keating, as we are Holy Apostles College and Seminary, WCAT Radio is a is an arm of Holy Apostles College and Seminary, um, and there are a fair number of those who are tuning into this program who are men in formation and their formators. If you were speaking to just that part of the audience, not everyone else out there who's trying to discern their universal call for holiness and how to live it, but the, the part of our audience that are men in formation and their formators, if you had a single nugget to leave for them, what would that nugget be? Be uh, truly engaged in formation and put a stop to any negative thoughts that you may wake up every morning with the seminary. Either you're being assailed by them or in some way you're welcoming them, negative thoughts that may drag down uh, your spirit into despair or into worry or useless anxiety, as the liturgy says. And uh, push against those thoughts and make yourself fully available, fully vulnerable to be engaged in the four areas of formation. In this way and only this way, you'll be free to discern your vocation and even more importantly, free to joyfully accept it. That's a great piece of advice. Thank you. It has been a joy to spend this time with you, and we are getting toward the end of our time, and I am grateful, Deacon Keating, for share, you coming on this program and sharing your expertise in seminary for, formation and sharing a, a, just a, a brief sketch of the three chapters that you have in Spiritual Husbands, Spiritual Fathers, Priestly Formation for the 21st Century. Would you be so kind as to close this segment with a prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for our vocations, and we ask you for the grace to fully receive them, to fully uh, welcome your call to live your mysteries over again in our bodies. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. And thank you. Thank you again, Deacon Keating. And for those who are listening, this is again WCAT Radio's Vows, Vocations, and Promises, Discerning the Call of Love. And you have been listening to Deacon James Keating. Thank you for tuning in, and have a blessed Feast of St. Therese today. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. To a production of WCAT Radio, please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.